Nasim, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we will be discussing a patient who came to AR with history of persistent cough with blood and sputum. Shall we sir? Sir, a 52 year old male patient was brought to AR with history of blood and sputum since that day evening. The last episode was about 45 minutes before coming to the hospital. From my initial 10 section assessment, the patient was conscious, oriented and was able to, follow, uh, was able to respond to our commands. And <coughs> So we went to the primary survey. His airway was patent uh, with no pulling of secretions or gurgling of sound. There was no hoarseness of his voice or any abnormal airway sounds. Uh, he was kept in a propped up position about 30 to 45 degree and with head and elevated. And on breathing part he had um, bilateral adequate and symmetrical chest rise. And on auscultation he had clear chest bilaterally with equal air entry. A respiratory rate of 20 per minute was there and a SPO2 of 97% in room where he maintained. And <coughs> Circulatory part, he had good peripheral pulses and he had a pulse rate of 70 per minute and blood pressure of 140 by 80 millimeters of mercury. At this point, we are uh, acquired uh, two large bar IV axes of 18 gauge size. Disability part, he had a full score of GCS and pupils were equally reactive. Now, what does indication were two large bar IV cannulas? The thing is actually, even though he was giving a history of him blood in sputum, we are not sure whether it is actually hemoptysis or any other cause also. Just as a precautionary measure, we went with a large bore axis. Okay, so you said blood and sputum, isn't it? Mm. Okay, you're coming to the history part. Yeah. Okay, okay. Right. So at this point of uh, like case, like you don't have anything intervention to be done at this point of no. time. So why the patient was put up in a propped up position? Uh, once again, actually, uh, the thing is actually the blood in uh, uh, coughing up blood can sometimes actually obstruct the airway. Okay. And also it can uh, help him breathe easily if he's put in a propped up position. Because okay, the blood so, did, uh, so what is the ideal, what is the ideal position uh, for the patient if the patient is having active hem hemoptysis? Uh, if he's actually if he is conscious or and he is able to protect his airway reflexes, we can keep him in a propped position, okay. 30 to 45 degree. Okay. Suppose he's unresponsive or drowsy or something, we have to uh, like put him in a uh, like uh, a 10 to 20 degree below the supine level, so as to avoid this thing aspiration. Hemoptysis, uh, we can also go for a lateral decubitus position with the uh, affected lung and the lower side like to prevent causes. How do you know that which side is affected? If obviously we have any like a history of any uh, like uh, previous surgery being done yeah. to that side or like or trauma recently to that side or uh, on obvious clinical examination, if we have any finding like that, we can go for such a position. Okay, what is uh, what is indication for doing so? Okay, you're saying the left lateral. Suppose this patient is having. Okay, the, you are putting the patient in the left lateral position. Mm -hmm. So uh, why not in the right lateral? Suppose yeah, as you say, like the affected lung is on the left side. If the affected lung is on the left side, we uh, with the left lung on the lower like uh, uh, lower side, like it should be uh, on the it's lower left side. Left uh, okay. So uh, that uh, so the blood position. won't spill onto the mm -hmm. other side. side. So basically to avoid spillage of the contents mm -hmm. onto the opposite, opposite lung. Side. And to make that airway patent onto the other side. Mm -hmm. To like uh, proper functioning of the lung and other parameters. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. <coughs> so since this the saturation? Initial uh, saturation uh, 97% in room mm -hmm. So this patient was having uh, proper airway reflexes and conscious and oriented. So we put him in a 30 degree proper position. <coughs> and so exposure part, he had a temperature of 97.4 and we, to prevent hypothermia, we provide a blanket. And urgent to air primary survey, uh, GRB was taken, it was 104 milligram per deciliter. And EBG was taken, it was not showing any <coughs> acid base disturbance and HB was 14.4. Then ECG was taken. Do you expect a hemoglobin fall in this patient? Uh, not again, if it's a proper hemoglobin, it's very unlikely unless it's a massive hemoglobin. So what do you mean by massive hemoptysis? Uh, like if the patient is losing more than 100 ml per hour or like more than 600 over 24 hours. 500? Ah, 500. In 24 hours. 24 okay. hours. Fine. So what else could be the parameter you are looking forward in ABG? Mm -hmm. One is elevated lactate levels. Okay. There is any hemodynamic instability. Okay. Potential reperfusion. And then... Then basic acid base disturbance and things there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, when you are having an active hemoptysis, mm -hmm. uh, in, you are doing a complete blood profile for this patient. Mm -hmm. So, which parameter which you will think will be altered before hemoglobin drop? Because of hypoperfusion, lactic levels, lactic 
I am talking about complete blood pressure. Let's see. Hematocrit. Hematocrit. Okay. Hematocrit. Okay. Pulse rate? Uh, pulse rate 76. No, no. Uh, In that case. Uh, what is the first I, indicator? Uh, I, tachycardia. Tachycardia. Mm. tachycardia. Tachycardia. Unless he is on any drug, beta blocker or other reasons. Mm. Mm. So the first one is tachycardia. tachycardia. Okay. So is he a young chap or? Uh, 52. 52. So 52 year old? Okay. Fine. Carry on. And uh, one more this thing. The massive hemoptysis. Now the new terminology coined. What is the technology? Any idea? Life threatening hemoptysis. Mm. Mm. Because this guy calculates only in terms of the volume of blood lost, which sometimes the patient may not be able to assess and tell mm. properly. The life-threatening that includes one is airway obstruction, aspiration, hemodynamic instability, all these criteria also put in. Mm. So now the new terminology is life-threatening mm. hemoptysis. Okay. An incision was also taken by showing a normal sinus rhythm at 80 beats per minute and no significant STD changes. And a chest X-ray was also ordered, and then we went ahead with the reassessment. The air primary survey reassessment, airway, breathing, circulation, everything is well maintained, and the patient is also hemodynamically stable. So we went ahead with the secondary survey. Uh, signs and symptoms: He had a history of cough for the past two days, which was in that day morning, and by around afternoon he was actually coughing up with uh, sputum with uh, bloodish tinge. Uh, about three four times he cough up uh, blood blood stained sputum. Uh, before that, actually, for the past two days, he was have actually having scandy whitish expectoration. Scandy? Scandy whitish expectoration. But that day, since afternoon, he is having blood stain sputum. <coughs> about total, he uh, described as about 15 to 20 ml of blood he vomited up, I mean, coughed up. And there was no specific aggravating or relieving factors, and there was no shortness of breath or any history of fever. Uh, he didn't have any history of recent weight loss or any night sweats, also, no history was there. And he was a spray painter by profession, spray painter. And also he's a non-smoker, but occasionally indulges in alcohol, uh, once in once or twice in a month or something like that. <coughs> he has no history of any drug allergies and not on any medications as of now, and no history of any recent uh, surgeries or any medical history. <coughs> His last meal was about six hours before coming to the hospital. The event was basically this, uh, the patient was apparently normal two days back, and slowly he developed this cough. Uh, so, um, and intermittent cough and which progressed to a blood stain sputum by that evening. Uh, he stated it was bright red in color. The sputum was bright red in color. And even we went ahead with the clinical examination. He was a, a lean, built and nourished male. And there was no ictrus, no pallor, no cyanosis, no clubbing and no edema. On respiratory system examination, he had bilateral uh, equal air entry and chest. So before the uh, mm. system examination, you said the patient is a non-smoker. Okay, non-smoker. Non -smoker. So, what is the significance of non-smoker having hemoptysis? Mm. Smoker, actually, we have to expect a uh, long term. We have to expect COPD and those kind of complications. Okay. Which may or may not be detected over time. Okay. And uh, since the patient is a non-smoker, we have to think about other causes like vasculitis or any uh, malignancy or anything like that. Mm. Malignancy at this age, at the age of fifties. Then maybe vasculitis or any infection, pneumonia or... Mm. Infections. Like okay. What are the possible infections which you will think of? Mm. As in India, the most common is tuberculosis, which we have a lot. Okay. Mm. Then any other loba pneumonia or any other infections. Okay. Any, any, peculiarly any sort of... Uh, parasitic. 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 Uh, Paragonimus vestimony is a parasitic infection which can cause hemoptysis. Then serratia can cause he in a serratia that is bacterial yeah, infection. Talk about something very common. You're, you're talking about something Clepsia. probably down the list. Mm. Red currant jelly, uh, Clepsia. 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 Mm. Okay. Is he alcoholic? Alcoholic. Occasional alcoholic. Occasional alcoholic. Okay. Mm. So Clepsia is still a Most possibility, common. isn't it? Mm. Okay. Anything else? Mm. Bronchitis can present. Chronic bronchitis. Is it chronic bronchitis or acute bronchitis? Acute bronchitis. Acute bronchitis. Acute bronchitis. Okay. And uh, you said thin built. Mm. And tuberculosis can cause hemoptysis. Mm. Active tuberculosis and prior tuberculosis both can cause hemoptysis. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. One is? Cavity is chronic. Yes, cavity ulceration in active tuberculosis mm. can cause hemoptysis. What about prior tuberculosis? What is the cause of? Hemoptysis in prior tuberculosis. Hydrosis bands can cause 
Bronchopathic changes will be there. Uh, post fibrosis actually, a new vascularization can occur in the alveoli. Basically, the ulceration of the already calcified lymph node mm. that can actually ulcerate and cause hemoptosis. Mm. Why this is important? Because he have already mentioned about this is progressive hemoptosis. This is not acute hemoptosis. He had this sort of hemoptosis which has been there in streaks. So he may not have like probably notified or maybe like he would have ignored in the past. So this is something like progressive hemoptosis. It can be classified as acute because it was found probably in a day and he reported to the hospital that day itself. But it could be a possibility of blood stringed, maybe like it's a progressive hemoptosis. So all this progressive disorder should be considered. Okay, sir. The history you can uh, have a look and uh, keep in mind about the profession or occupation. Mm. Occupational asbestosis and mm. he may be exposed and evening rise of temperature. Mm. Even though we are not giving much importance for the temperature variations. Mm. But evening rise of temperature is also mm. one of the things we can keep mm. in mind. So this patient is actually a spray painter by profession. Okay. And one more thing uh, is... Uh, painter. Uh, painter. One more thing is you said about malignancy. Mm. So uh, is, is there any differential diagnosis to be considered mm. when a young uh, aged person mm. possibly coming with hemoptosis diagnosed to have malignancy? There is something called as bronchial carcinoid, mm. which actually presents as a malignancy in a young aged gentleman presenting with hemoptosis. Mm. That is also progressive hemoptosis. It's not that, uh, I mean, 50 is not a young age, but then still mm. comparing all the malignancy cases, like 50 is basically a young age, mm. but still you have to consider bronchial carcinoid mm. that is presenting as, uh, usually as hemoptosis. progressive hemoptosis. Okay. <coughs> so clinical examination went to the systemic examination, a uh, respiratory system, chest was clear and bilateral equal urinary was there. Trachea was in the midline, there was no dilated wings and upper <coughs> oral cavity nose, everything was in normal limits. Uh, mm -hmm. cardi uh, cardiovascular system again with the normal limits. I mean, uh, uh, secondary examination patient is stable. Mm. We will be proceeding from head to toe. Head to toe. So if, what is pseudo hemoptysis? <coughs> How will you eliminate? Uh, we have to rule out any epistaxis which can present, appear like hemoptysis. Upper, uh, Upper airway. Upper airway. Or from the gastrointestinal. Uh, okay. This may be aspirated mm. and then again it may be brought out. Mm. But the, the color mm. will be varied. Mm. Mm. So we have to rule out epistaxis and hematomasis which both can actually patient mm. present like hemoptysis. So that also should be examined patient. Mm. We have to examine the oral cavity, mm. nasal cavity, everything. Mm. Mm. So this patient's oral cavity, upper nose, everything was clear. Mm. There was no blood stains or anything. Okay. And trachea was in middle line and there was no dilated veins. Good. Then cardiovascular system, uh, chest uh, bilat, uh, is one to a heart, there is no murmur heard. And gastrointestinal system, we was, uh, abdomen was soft and non-tender. And nervous system, there was no obvious findings. In cardiovascular uh, mm. system, any cause do you suspect with pertaining uh, to hemoptysis? Suppose if you are uh, occurring, uh, hearing MS or something, mycle can be, can cause this thing. And then pulmonary pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary artery hypertension. Okay. Mm. So, speed. Uh, Yes, stenosis. Mm -hmm. Also, it's easy we can look for AF in any also the AF or something. So that that went with the clinical examination and then uh, diagnostic investigations. Uh, the X-ray came at that time. The X-ray was also not showing any obvious uh, any findings. It was also clear. And so we went ahead with the management part. So this patient actually was already on a trolley with the head done raised. And uh, to, uh, to suppress the cough, we gave a syrup lupitus, uh, which 15 ml stat, which is actually a levoclopirastin uh, uh, fensodiacetyl. Which one you give? Uh, lup syrup lupitus, mm -hmm. basically cough suppressant. It's a non opioid cough suppressant because we don't want the patient to go drowsy mm -hmm. or something. So. And along with that, actually, uh, we give. A 2 mg morphine IM was given and ondan syndrome was also given. You said the patient doesn't, you don't want the patient to go drowsy, but then you still give morphine? IM was given. Uh, IM so won't cause drowsiness? So, for a little slow release, it's actually we have to uh, reduce the anxiety of the patient and all that. Okay. Rate is 70, BP is normal. Mm. That is the question. Mm. Mm. It's answering well. Sandler's where is indicated, don't use sedative drugs, especially mm. when the patient is having cardiac respiratory problem. Mm. Okay. And tranexamic acid 1 gram was given in 100 ml over uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Mm. And along with that, uh, nebulized tranexamic acid was also given mm. for the patient. 
and with this findings actually uh, we gave also give a chronology consultation for the further evaluation mm -hmm. and he was admitted for observation why did he uh, give tranexamic acid because studies actually have proven not proven a uh, uh, number of recent studies have shown that actually tranexamic acid given can reduce the occurrence of hematases and also even if it's occurring the blood loss can be controlled can reduce the volume of the uh, blood but it cannot reduce the duration but at least the volume of the uh, can, be can be controlled Okay. Any uh, drug history? Anything no. which is causing? Uh, no, it's not on any not on any medication. Or or okay. So basically, this patient comes under a non-life threatening hemoglobinosis, mm -hmm. and also not very severe. Uh, so he was actually placed under observation, and right now he's admitted for observation. Okay. So, um, uh, is there any other drug where like you can use in this situation actually? Ethamcelate can also be used. Ethamcelate. Ethamcelate. Mm. Okay. What But, is ethamcelate? Epsilon amino caprylic acid. Okay. If there is a uh, 200 mg is usually given but uh, there is uh, we it can be given but it is not very proven benefits are not there. Tranexamic acid amount is superior to ethamcelate. Okay. Uh, sure. um, do you give any steroids when hmm. the patient presents with hemoptysis? Uh, is there no. a role for any steroids? No, not usually indicated. So, uh, how do you manage this case of hemoptysis in the ER when a patient comes like this? Mm, basically, if the patient is coming to ER, we have to first uh, confirm this hemoptysis. We have to put other causes like any epistaxis or hemoptysis or something by taking a clear history. And also, we have to uh, assess the patients like the amount of blood loss, whether it is massive or not. Anything more than 100 ml per hour and more than 500 per ml per hour in our 24 hour period is considered to be massive or life threatening. Along with that, we have to also assess the hemodynamic status of the patient. Any <coughs> hypertension or anything like that, we have to assess. And also, any chance for airway compromise or any altered mental status. And suppose the patient is in a non life threatening situation, again, actually, uh, we can go with conservative management like uh, this thing, uh, like uh, cough suppressants and anti anxiolytic measures and rexamic acid. And we can go for a chest x ray. Suppose chest x ray is uh, showing some findings, actually, we can admit the patient for further evaluation observation. What other findings are you expecting in a patient with mm. noctosis and chest uh, Any cavitatory lesion or any okay. signs of any pneumonia or anything or any lung fibrosis, any tracheal sh shift or anything. Okay. Mm. Mass lesions. Any mass lesions. lesions. lesions can be diffused, uh, mm. uh, if it is focal, uh, it can be because of mass consolidation, uh, cavity. Uh, so, how do you differentiate uh, uh, in X-ray, how do you differentiate a mass or a consolidation from hemorrhage? Consolidation will be mostly present in the air bronchogram. Okay. Uh, mass will be having that uh, the border. Defined Homogeneous, well defined border. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hemorrhage will be like more bright intensity, white intensity. So mm. uh, And will it be like regular or irregular? Irregular. Irregular. Okay. Fine. It will be like pertain to one lobe or like it will be like it can be variable. Can be either a diffuse other than hemorrhage or like focal thing. So it need not be like to one lobe. It can spill over to. It depends upon how the chest X-ray has been taken. If the patient is in supine position, it will be different. It is, if it is an erect position, it will spill onto the dependent portion. Fine. Mm -hmm. So if chest X-ray is normal and if the patient is not having any further episodes and is stable, we can actually discharge the patient. Is there anything else very peculiarly you will see in chest X-ray? Mm. Other than cardiac, the lungs? Cardiac shadow. Cardiac shadow. Okay, what in cardiac shadow? In the mediastinal widening. Okay. Mm. Mm. Left atrial dilatation. Left atrial dilatation. dilatation. What are you suspecting there? Uh, associated uh, severe MS. Severe MS, okay. Mm. And boundary artery hypertension, pH. Okay, so there will be like left heart, border Straightening of Straightening. Yes. Straightening of it. Okay, fine. Yeah. pH, yeah. Fine. So, suppose the patient is not showing any further episodes and the x-ray everything is normal, we can actually discharge the patient and ask him to follow up. And if the 
you will discharge a case of hemoptysis no i mean after admission after evaluation routines and everything done and x ray everything is normal and he is not having any further episodes he can be discharged so that means you will observe in the ed for how many hours uh la we can transport to our the neurology department for admission and after okay. one day observation so okay. ideally what the guidelines are saying is like you will be like observing in the er mm. for at least uh, like 6 to 12 hours mm. so if your er is a very busy place where like actually you can't keep the patient in the er you observe mm. and you discharge probably the very next day or something mm. okay and it depends upon the how the intensity of the hemoptysis is, mm. isn't it mm. okay mm. suppose if you are getting any finding in the x-ray then we have to further evaluate mm. to find out the cause and then treat accordingly Yeah. and suppose the patient is coming in a, a life threatening situation a life threatening hemoptysis we have to act aggressively we will go by a b c d like starting from every protection and then breathing and circulation there we suppose the patient is conscious and oriented we can as before in keeping proper position but we have to always think about anticipate and arrest and intubation and everything and we have to prepare everything accordingly and along with that uh, we have to uh, manage the active hemoptysis Mm. which will be possible like what is the recovery position patient is unconscious which position you will get ideal in such cases uh, to our task position before you are intervening in any other way one thing is actually we can keep 10 to 20 degree below the uh, supine level and mm. give suctioning along with oxygenation okay. that is one position we can do or we can try left lateral position okay. this both can be tried so the patient is unconscious if there is no any other nurses to mm. clear the secretion yet we do not know which mm. side of the lung is affected mm. but still you can keep the patient let him mm. so that the mm. uh, bleeding will be trickling out mm. it will not collecting in the throat and with every inspiration it will be aspirated mm. okay now that only the problem is if the affected side is up mm. normal side is, there will be spillage mm. also in a rapidly deteriorating patient actually we have to consider early intubation than going for any niv or any other mm-hmm. sort of non invasive ventilation so niv is a contraindication uh, in a rapidly deteriorating patient yes mm-hmm. so you tell me something very specific of intubation mm-hmm. what uh, sort of tube will you use in this patient actually we prefer for a higher, wide bore tube like 8 or 8.5 size because we can our further plan will be a bronchoscopy to explore further okay. so actually we can go for a 8 or 8.5 tube uh, to be if possible which one mm-hmm. and why it is possible so this is one condition where you use the maximum, maximum diameter mm-hmm. of the tube should be used why mm-hmm. because you have to eventually you have to pass down the bronchi and you have to pass down the bronchoscope also mm-hmm. because you have to know where exactly the mm-hmm. location mm-hmm. of the bleed and size of the bleed also mm-hmm. mm-hmm. so the moving clots are anything mm so clear the airway soft section mm-hmm. okay. mm-hmm. and is there any peculiarity by which like you can use uh, something else other than the normal tube and we can say double lumen tube why what is the purpose of double lumen tube here one thing is actually it has on it has two tubes with two cups two two cups and two tubes hmm. one will go into the bronchus and one will be in the trachea uh, so suppose you are suspecting on one side the lesion actually we can use the uh, insert the bronchial tube to that area and um, inflate the cuff as a Okay, for single lung ventilation sir mm. um uh, the indications are usually we can prevent um, the uh, um, normal lung from getting infected uh, if it is an infection in the one side or uh, prevent the spillage or if at all the affected lung is having some uh, bullae or something so uh, to prevent the uh, inflation of that lung and uh, to uh, to improve the ventilation status in the normal lungs mm. and uh, Uh, and for if at all we are planning for a procedure or something uh, in the affected lung uh, then that also uh, will help oxygenation in the normal lungs will be going on and uh, that lung can be pneumonectomy yeah. or some procedure wax can use the ventilation to a uh, lung where there is a suspected uh, bronchial trauma mm. like in uh, bronchial dissection and trauma or if this, there is a bronchocutaneous or bronchoscopic fistula or something like that to reduce the ventilation to that side and these are the conditions where we use the single lung ventilation first and foremost is first go with a larger size central tracheal tube it should be larger more than at least eight mm. for providing this mm. number two do your bronchoscopy now at this stage you clear mm. you are protecting the airway and you are making the airway clearance mm. then do your bronchoscopy then only you will be knowing which side is affected mm. where is the pathology mm. once you come to know only we will be i think 
which side tube mm. one lung ventilation or a double lumen tube mm. whichever want is left sided double lumen or right sided double lumen mm. that we can select mm. so initial go with the endotracheal tube mm. then do a bronchoscopy after that you come to know mm. which side is affected in the case mm. then accordingly we can go for this one. Okay. after putting a double lumen tube we can also put a fogartis uh, catheter to block mm-hmm. the this thing if there is case of an emergency in ed itself we can use okay so uh, what is the importance of uh, uh, anatomy here anatomy of the bleed here uh, basically the patient presents with hemoptysis uh, basically majority of the alveolar everything supplied by the pulmonary artery but it is actually having a, a low tension system uh, so in a patient is having hemoptysis the most uh, primary culprit is actually bronchial arteries because of the high pressure within the system uh, so whenever we are seeing a patient with hemoptysis about 90% of the bleed will be due to any bronchial artery bleed and <coughs> suppose the patient is having any reason to do any reason any new formation or a new vascularization of bronchial arteries like any uh, chronic bronchitis or COPD patient with a new vascularization around the alveoli uh, these things are actually more prone to rupture over prolonged duration of time so in a chronic COPD patient actually as time passes by there will be new vascularization around the alveoli from the bronchial artery which are more prone for rupture because of the high pressure system so which is a more high pressure system like a bronchial artery and bronchial its artery. this branches and bronchial artery is basically from the systemic arteries is it from systemic arteries because there is something mm. less intrinsic blood supply for the lung and mm. extrinsic mm. so extrinsic is basically from the bronchial arteries mm. is it com- rightly coming from the aorta uh. systemic arteries so what i am trying uh. to ask you is which hemoptysis which type of hemoptysis will have more fulminant hemoptysis that's like massive mm. hemoptysis from pulmonary circulation or from the bronchial circulation bronchial circulation bronchial circulation mm. okay from the pulmonary circulation is basically is a low pressure system isn't mm. it mm. but high flow high flow high flow so it is more of progressive Continuous. in nature mm. so when a patient presents with progressive hemoptysis mm. that means in streaks of hemoptysis mm. it's mostly pulmonary, pulmonary. Mm. but if the patient comes with bouts of hemoptysis most like bronchial. mostly it will be bronchial yeah. why that is important because if the patient presents with bouts of hemoptysis you have to counsel the patient by standards that yeah. patient may go for cardiac resuscitation cardiac arrest resuscitation definitely at any point of time yeah. so he will require an icu stay yeah. and under no conditions this patient can be either discharged or go to ward yeah. so the the way you counsel the bystanders requires a special mentionable because you will be knowing that, okay this could be a possibility of another mass about one more like mass about can end up his mm. probably can rupture the whole vessels mm. isn't it mm. right and so that is the importance of knowing the anatomy of the bleed mm. what is cataminal hemoptysis uh, related to menstruation actually okay endometriosis in the endometriosis uh, in lungs So during menstruation, the patient might present with hemoptysis. Okay. Uh, It's an extension of endometriosis. Okay. Menstruation. So there are two types of okay. That is cataminal. Okay. So there are two types of aneurysms which is there in the pulmonary artery. Mm. Okay. One is true aneurysm and one is pseudo aneurysm. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. What is Raspian Sims aneurysm? Cavitatory lesions are there. Uh, the blood vessels will be going through the margin of the. Uh, cavity and that there will be pseudo aneurysms uh, formed and this can rupture leading to uh, like hematysis mostly associated with tb cavities hmm tb cavities are malignancies isn't it okay so you can sum up the case now uh, so before the life threatening causes actually if the patient is a hemodynamically unstable situation actually we can even go for bronchoscopy in ed if feasible in ed itself, mm. yes is mm. it rigid or flexible uh, flexible flexible mm. preferably flexible mm. okay so and if the patient is actually holding up uh, then we can go for a this thing a uh, ctp mm. and, and once a ctp is done actually we can find out the culprit artery and actually go for uh, radiological intervention like bronchial artery embolization yes. is also possible yes yes is the uncle fine you can sum up the case now mm. so basically 52 year old male patient with uh, a uh, spray painter by profession with no other comorbs and not a smoker with history of two days of worsening of hemoptysis present over here uh, by our initial assessment which was conscious oriented and we give the uh, supportive and symptomatic management mm-hmm. and on our assessment he was having a long life threatening hemoptysis and actually 
uh, since actually uh, after coming to here he didn't have any further episodes and our initial evaluation was within normal limits he was admitted for further observation evaluation currently he is undergoing his testing in hospital any other questions sir see the left threatening massive hemorrhage mm. so the first initial bronchoscopy we can use the rigid bronchoscope because mm. wider diameter mm. we can completely visualize in addition we have to put suction and clear the entire tracheobronchial tree mm. which is coming uh, rapid mm. so the regular conventional this one like fibro uh, mm. flexible bronchoscopy will not be suitable for mm. heavy suction mm. so directly you go for a rigid bronchoscopy mm. then clear it Yeah. and through the rigid bronchoscopy itself we can pass the yeah. flexible bronchoscope and then go on assess whether which side is affected right or side yeah. if possible what is the cause for that yeah. if anything can be done simple therapeutic measures you can at this junction yeah. itself we can able yeah. to do it then we have to go for the selection of the single lung one lung ventilation or double lung tube so in a one lung ventilation what are the different types of tubes available So which lung you will be easier or better? So what is the difference between using the one lung ventilation tube to a left bronchus or right bronchus? Is there anything? Because right actually it's more easier, and and if you are going for left bronchus, we need a fiber optic to confirm the insertion. And that can be done only with a bronchus bronchus group guidance. Guidance. So the right is easier. Mm. What is the advantage disadvantage in these two aspects? Uh, even if you are going for single lung ventilation, actually. Uh, expanding the cuff can actually obstruct the upper branches of the, the right side mm-hmm. see the opening of the right main bronchus to mm-hmm. the upper lobe upper lobe okay. can be obstructed so that is we are at very short distance from the carina mm-hmm. so the tubes the cuff will be little longer that will be when you are uh, inflating that will block it mm-hmm. so that a zone of the lung will not be ventilated mm-hmm. it will go for the collapse mm-hmm. okay so that will be avoided and the uh, left side but only thing is it is little difficult to pass it and it can be done with the bronchoscopic guidance so the main advantage is a long lengthy at this time upper lobe division is at a distance okay. okay then regarding the double lumen tube okay. see what is the advantage over single lumen tube or double lumen tube? Uh, one cuff can be deflected and we can introduce a fogartic catheter mm. uh, to block the bleeding in this the main problem mm. here is there are two tubes mm. going together Mm. one will end at the end of at the trachea, trachea. Mm. so that too there is difference between the right and left tube mm. see the whenever you are using a left side tube the, the trachea about 2 uh, to 3 cm from the carina mm. the um, tracheal tube will stop mm. so when you are using a right side uh, right right side double lumen tube it will go up to the carina mm. tracheal tube so on next one is the bronchial the bronchial tube that will be going on each one is having a separate cup mm. so the lumens will be very small mm. so the using a suction or passing some therapeutic measures we cannot be easily done with this one mm. so single lumens mm. and one lung ventilation here we will be ventilating both the lungs at the same time protecting the unaffected lung mm. so that is the main advantage mm. in one lung ventilation what are the complications do you anticipate most important complication uh, and what are the ventilator strategies Uh, one session we have to go for a low tidal volume about no four, tidal, to six, four to 6 ml per ah, kg okay. tidal volume mm-hmm. we have to go for and also we don't we shouldn't expect a, like a 100% saturation this kind of patients if the patient is having above 90% saturation yeah, okay, okay. 90 and above, above. Okay. and also the patient's baseline uh, pco2 value if we are knowing we have to maintain that pco2 level very good okay uh, and also uh, so accordingly the rate can be adjusted mm-hmm. okay complications can be uh, inadequate of impurpose it can cause barrel trauma and damage to the anaphter lung also so which pressure uh, mm. cycle or volume cycle uh, pressure cycle no okay. mm. barrel trauma barrel trauma can avoid the barrel trauma mm. okay any other uh, then mm. so are we pressure mm. try to maintain we less than 20 to 30 mm. okay these are all things here This such a way patients because of the online ventilation suddenly they may be going for uh, hypoxia. 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 Mm. Okay. Mm. If persistent hypoxia is not recurring, so suppose the hypoxia not, occurs, what will how will you manage? Uh, one thing is actually we can go with uh, dog. There is displacement, animal uh, thoracic everything. Yeah, that is. Find out. And if there is no way we can improve the hypoxia, we have to pull out the tube and go for a regular intubation. Regular intubation. 
Genau. Danke. Thanks.